Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Welcome back to Think Tech here on a given Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock block. I'm Jay Fidel. Our special show today is called CONCON 101. We're going to talk about constitutional conventions. It's very important, as you'll find out, that, that we cover constitutional conventions now and on the way to November so that we all understand what it is, how it works here and elsewhere as a comparative ana analysis, and what issues are going to come up, and what, how we should you know, cast our vote in November about CONCON here in Hawaii. Um, very interesting discussion, one that is very important to civic engagement. So for this uh, for this program, we have J. H. Snyder, um, and he's flown in from uh, Boston, I guess, huh? Maryland. Maryland, well, that's yeah. right near Boston. Yeah, it? yeah, pretty close. He's the editor of the Hawaii State ConCon Clearinghouse, yeah, uh, and he's he, he fashions. Um, policy around CONCON all over the country. Uh, and then we have Peter Adler, he's director of ThinkTech, and he is also the director of Accord 3.0 uh, Network. Thank you so much for being here, Peter. A pleasure. So I guess the first question is, and I told you I was going to ask you this, J.H., how'd you get into the studio? What are you here for? Well, uh, Hawaii has a referendum on November 6th, and it's the next state. There are 14 states with this institution. Hawaii is the next one in the cycle. Most states that have the institution have it once every 20 years. Hawaii has it once every 10 years. In addition to running the Hawaii State Constitutional Convention Clearinghouse, I run a clearinghouse for the 14 states that have this institution. And uh, typically, um, the level of uh, information about why this exists in the Constitution, what the function of this institution is, is very poor. And so I try to poor. elevate the discussion. Uh, what do you, what do you mean poor? I mean, how has it revealed itself as poor? Well, um, most Americans apparently don't even know they have a state constitution, let alone that there's a mechanism to change it the uh, State Constitutional Convention. Americans are not taught in school why we have this institution. What is its distinctive function in the State Constitution? And what are um, the important issues that this type of um, yeah. uh, institution can address that our other mechanism, legislatively initiated constitutional amendments, yeah. A sad address. commentary on the state of public education about, about government. Yeah. It's very sad. Um, America used to focus on state government in the 19th century. It was more important, but as power shifted to the federal government, and we basically nationalized our curriculum for college tests and whatnot, uh, people simply don't learn about their state constitutions. I would be surprised if a tenth of one percent of Hawaiians, probably much less, have even read their state constitution. The most fundamental thing is people often don't even know they have a state constitution. Yeah, we, we try to help them here at ThinkTech, and uh, and Peter does at Accord 3.0 Network. Um, so we, you know, and this I is would the kind imagine of discussion we want to have almost no education about Hawaii's state constitution in the schools. In the schools. They learn about the federal constitution. You can take into yeah. American government; it's there. It's a problem all over college students. They learn about American government. They don't learn about. So, the as state the law. editor of the uh, the Hawaii State Con Con Clearing Constitutional Convention Clearinghouse and the other publications you handle for those for yeah. fourteen other states, I guess. Yeah. Um, you know, what what is your mission? What do you hope to achieve? And again, why are you here? Well, uh, on the website, I put everything that's available online, pro and con. So every op-ed, every news story from this cycle um, is on the website, uh, as well as a lot of auxiliary information in terms of uh, government websites and um, historical documents. So in addition to the current cycle, I have every cycle going back to 1950 information. So Hawaii's had three state constitutional conventions since its founding, 1950. 1968 and 1978, and it's also had multiple referendum, and I tried to put all that information there so when reporters and opinion leaders are trying to say something thoughtful about it, they can look at the history and of the institution. you've written a number of articles, too, I, of local publications on this subject. I, I've written uh, a series for Civil Beat and the uh, Honolulu Star Advertiser, and I will write more trying to uh, get people prepared to have a thoughtful discussion about it. Now, my position is 
I am a defender of the institution. I think it provides, I think there's no more fundamental political right than the right to, to reform your constitution, and it's meaningless if you can't bypass the legislature in implementing mm. that right. If so you're, given not, veto you're not power, casting either for or against having a, a constitution on any specific point well, of time or any jurisdiction? Well, that is not my focus, but because I am defending the institution as a democratic institution, I want people to understand its democratic function, why it exists in the Constitution, and um, provide comparative and historical information so they understand how it's functioned in the past, uh, why Hawaii's framers and ratifiers, you know, approved this institution in the Constitution. So I just would like an elevated discussion, and I will defend the institution if people smear it, but if also people say things that can't be justified. I mean, all democratic and you're here institutions for are flawed. Yes. Okay. Yes. Hey, Peter, why are you here? Um, well, first of all, I'm, I'm very uh, interested in this topic. Uh, this is an outgrowth of a conference that you and I were both involved in last December on trying to elevate the level of civic engagement and participation. Hawaii is not doing very well in that. And we don't have a very good public discourse. We don't have civil debates. Uh, and that we talked about all that in December, and that's been, that was then. And one of the outgrowths of it was a, a group that I pulled together uh, which has just concluded in March, and we wanted to take up uh, a discussion about the con uh, prospects of a constitutional convention that will be on the ballot in November. And not so much to debate the yes or no, but rather to uh, kind of lift up the rock and understand some of the nuanced issues of it. Uh, it was very successful. We had wonderful, three wonderful discussions. We held those at the Civil Beat Law Center, thanks to Brian Black, who just let us use his room and participated. And uh, the up, up, upshot of it is that there will be four articles coming out that summarize what we just talked about. You will never hear in those articles, are we for or against? So just like JH, we have no, we're, we're really interested in trying to elevate the discussion and have a more educated discussion about it. Mm. And I'd just like to say that's an incredibly important thing to try to have a thoughtful discussion because the no campaign will come out, especially during the last month, if it's the poll, if it's the public continues to support the institution, and those will be sound bite-sized arguments. So to have a PR, thoughtful PR type argument, PR, yeah. yes, it'll be advertising. To have a thoughtful discussion is just very important. Yeah. Probably. Well, let's yeah. talk about that. I mean, that, that's obviously the focus for both you guys and for us. A thoughtful discussion. But we recognize that there will be people who will knee-jerk oppose any constitutional convention. So can we talk about what they would say in opposition and who they are? Well, uh, first of all, um, uh, there's a sort of a formula that's been worked out over these states, and a pretty effective formula to defeat these institutions. So. One of the things is, first of all, not to have a discussion. It turns out if you don't have a discussion and you create fear, people tend to vote no. If they don't understand something and it seems risky, they'll vote no. So the, the first thing the opposition tends to do is to not want a discussion, and at least not till very late in the process. But a, um, a critical issue is um, why do we have this institution, and the opposition will say, we already have a mechanism in place to amend the Constitution that's legislatively initiated constitutional how, how does that work in Hawaii? What do you have to do to get an amendment through, such as the real property tax uh, amendment that just got passed by the ledge? Well, the legislature has to approve a constitutional amendment, and then it does go to the public for ratification. Okay. That is today That's the best a simple known majority mechanism. vote in the Constitution. I, I mean, believe in Hawaii majority. it is a simple majority. So they, 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 just as any bill, they adopt this amendment, but it has to be ratified. Except the governor both. doesn't have veto power. Uh, he doesn't sign it. It bypasses him because it's a special, special kind of bill. Yes. Okay. Um, and then the second mechanism is completely bypasses the legislature in initiating the process, you have this referendum in November, which does what the legislature would be, should we have a constitutional convention. By the way, the legislature could also propose calling a constitutional convention, 
But it won't. Uh, and it does, it, 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 it doesn't it, accept on a ten-year basis. Why is the legislature? And, and I was, you know, getting at you know who would oppose this, and it sounds like the legislature itself is one of the institutional groups that would oppose it. Why would the legislature oppose it? So, so there, I think it's not legislature. It's it's uh, uh, highly ad more advanced politicians who are already in power would say, look, we have the form to do the changes that people want. Come to the legislature. So th they would oppose it. I think uh, many of the gains that have been done over the last 20 years uh, from by unions, by Native Hawaiians, others would come out and say, you know, we put things at risk if we have another con con. It's fear, as you were saying a moment ago. Yeah, we haven't really gotten into the politics here. We've sort of alluded to them. The but first issue is what is the function of this institution? Yeah. And the function is to have a way to bypass the legislature's veto power on constitutional amendment. Obviously, there are issues like legislative term limits, independent redistricting, legislative transparency. The legislature wants to have nothing to do with it. They're not going to propose amendments. The function, the modern function of this institution is to have this alternative mechanism. In most states that have a bypass mechanism, they use the popular initiative, the popular constitutional initiative. Hawaii doesn't have that. Its founders chose this bypass mechanism, which I think has significant advantages over the popular initiative as a bypass mechanism. So who else would oppose um, a, a con, con and participate in the anti-con con debate, uh, excuse me, um, um, public relations campaign, uh, say this summer? Who else? Who else is out there that we can expect well, the assistance from? I have an academic essay which looks at the politics of this institution as it's evolved over the last 240 years and how those groups have changed. Uh, in Hawaii and in the other states, basically since the 1980s, uh, it happens to be unions are the chief opponents. They organize the opposition. They put together very impressive coalitions. And uh, they're not the only part of the opposition. Right. Uh, very conservative Republicans who you know, don't like the idea. As soon as you mention Constitution, it's like changing the Bible. They're going to be opposed. And heavily regulated groups that do any group that does really well in the legislature does not like so the a ones who like the status quo. Are yes. going to oppose. Yes. So it's not Republicans and Democrats. It's really sort of reform versus status quo. And there was we don't an have Republicans. There's <laughs> actually a dissertation on the, uh, Hawaii's 1968 Constitution, and that it's it's his analytical framework. Yeah. There were the status quo forces and the reform forces, and that's yeah. how uh, he structures the political debate. So one more question before we go to the break is: you talked about a campaign, a uh, kind of a PR campaign. And I wonder what your thoughts are about when we might expect to see that come up. It sounds like that's the first salvo, the kind of the Fort Sumter salvo here. <laughs> and how, how will we notice, what will we see, what, what is going to happen, who's going to do what? Well, we can talk about the last referendum we had in um, uh, 2008. Yeah. The general strategy of the opposition is to come out as late as possible in the process, and they can do that if there's no for if there's no educational discussion or for campaign early, which doesn't look like in a wide. Oh, that's a gonna, very interesting so, point, J. H. Yeah. If there is a CONCON uh, -con 101 kind of discussion where there's somebody getting out there and trying to make the people understand this, then the guys who oppose it will mm -hmm. have to come out earlier. No, that's right. Yeah, but I would say the default and most likely in Hawaii, I would wait till September before the opposition. When the opposition comes out, they'll have dozens of groups uh, all signed on. It'll be much more professional than any yes campaign. There's no indication of any yeah. substantial yes Don't campaign. Forget, so September I, I, right 17th. Now, September 17th. It's Constitution Day, yes. Yeah, Constitution Day. Yeah. <laughs> right. Not widely known, but actually universities often hold events on <laughs> Constitution Day. So how do you think it will reveal itself, Peter? Uh, I think uh, JH is right. I think what's going to happen uh, in over the summer is we'll see more and more discussion, whether it be here, think tech, civil beat, uh, pu public broadcasting, uh, in the star advertiser. We'll start to see the letters to the editors, the commentaries, and that kind of stuff. And then late in the summer, we'll start to see the debate sharpen. And that's when, predictably, they'll, you know, the, the issues will start to, the hopes and the fears and the pros and the cons, from who, depending on who's talking, will all start to roll out. And I would emphasize the last few weeks before the referendum. That's when that's when they're advertising. Really yeah. It all depends on the polls. Right now, 
uh, the yes vote is ahead in the polls. Is that right? But uh, which is too early for that. That's right. It's, if that holds up, there will be a massive uh, set of attack ads that come out mostly in the last few weeks, yeah. and then people's attention. But it's rather late in the process yeah. when they don't even know what a constitution. It's all about is. timing. Uh, 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 yeah, it's all about timing, and right, so is uh, our show all about timing. And that's why we're going to take a break right now. Bingo. Okay. Hi, my name is Bill Sharp, host of Asian Review, coming to you from Honolulu, Hawaii, right here in the center of the Pacific Ocean. Asian Review is the oldest of the 35 or so shows um, uh, broadcast by Think Tech Hawaii. We've been in production since 2009. Our goal is to provide you, the viewer, with information, breaking information about events in Asia. Asia being anything from Hawaii west to Pakistan, from the Russian uh, Far East, south to Australia and New Zealand. We hope to see you every Monday afternoon at 5 p.m. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, your host on ThinkTech's Likeable Science Show. Every Friday at 2 p.m., we delve in the magical, magical, fascinating world of science, how science applies to your life, why you should care about science, what impact science has on you and on those around you, why you need to know some science. It's a fun, interesting, painless way to learn some good science that you can use. See you there. Okay, it is all about timing. We came back. We came back like Brill Cream. We came back. <laughs> mm, Brill Cream. <laughs> or MacArthur, if you like. <laughs> and that's Peter Adler on the, on the far left and uh, J.H. Schneider uh, next to me. And we're talking about ConCon 101. We're trying to get a handle on what it is and how it will work and who will be on what side of it. And gee whiz, elevating the discussion and public understanding. So the next part I'd like to talk about, ask you guys about, is so we, we have a general handle on who would oppose this and how they would oppose it. And when they would oppose sure. that. That's really a lot of good information. But who would support it? What groups can you predict will support it and how will they do that? JH? So it's a classic collective action problem. A, the no campaign is everybody who's invested in the status quo, which are the leading well-organized groups in the legislature. And the yes folks tend to be very dispirited. The track record of passing things, people don't want to invest time and energy and what's perceived as a hopeless cause. So every time it gets defeated, it makes it harder <clears throat> the next time around. Yeah. So traditionally, some good government groups have spoken up some. Example? The good government community is often um, a split on this issue because you know they're very dependent on legislators to get their own amendments in. And, you know they have to survive year in after yeah, year in out. Lobby. They got to get legislators because nobody wants to yeah, help so good government groups think? unless they're effective. Who would you? League well, of Women Voters. League of Women Voters. Not the League During the middle of so. the 20th century, they were the leading advocates for state constitutional conventions. I believe in Hawaii also they were leading advocates. So they were the, the league. But beginning in the 1980s and 1990s, the league, which is much weaker than it was, it, it, a classic book called Bowling Alone by the famous Harvard uh, sociologist, political scientist, talks about, has a section on the decline of the league in the Amer America. It's much less influential. But generally, the best you hope is that the league will engage in a thoughtful education uh, campaign and be neutral on the issue. Uh, they tend not to have much expertise any longer on these issues. So Anybody trying else? to elevate. Who, who's out there who you think? Well, sometimes there are local um, uh, good government groups, and those have been really um, uh, critical um, in, in Hawaii. And those groups have not stepped up. Common cause, I despair of um, for a variety of reasons. They're part of a coalition today that they need to survive as an institution. They're much, much weaker like the League than they were in the 70s mm -hmm. and in John Gardner's era. And I should mm -hmm. say, I, was, I lived in Vermont. I was the research chair and on the board of the local chapter of Common Cause. Uh, and, I, and so they're, they're, they, they should be all their core issues on redistricting reform, legislative transparency, big advocates, so, but who, they've sort of stayed out of it. Who's in left? I'm, I'm despairing myself here. Who's let me left? Try. Yeah, go ahead. Let me try go a little. For it. Go for so I, I think you're looking at organizations, and I'm not sure that's the place to look at the moment. 
uh, and I'm not arguing, I'm not advocating one way or another, but I do think one of the things we've learned in December at our participation conference was is the, the declining confidence and trust in government. And there's a declining trust in, uh, in all institutions, whether it's churches, universities, science institutes, doesn't matter. But government's at the bottom of those downward trends. And uh, that's also here in Hawaii. Colin Moore gave us some numbers from that he had found that showed the same thing. So if people are have confidence, this is a test of confidence. And if people feel that they have the confidence in the existing political structure through the legislature, through councils, through all the derivative things that come from constitutions, then they will say, we don't need it. Well, if on the other hand, people are disgruntled, then they're gonna say, we do need some structural reform. Some of this may wash over from national politics because oh, sure. it's tremendous. Especially in this yeah, administration. Exa that's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so I, I think people who, it's not a specific group. It's not League of Women Voters Common Cause or winning the specific advocacy groups. I think it's going to be something more subterranean. Is, is it, is it, it's grassroots. I guess. But I mean, are we talking about existing institutions, um, you know, who might form coalitions? Or are we talking about brand new institutions um, that come together with disgruntled uh, members of the electorate? Uh, or both? It may be both. I don't, I don't think, it's too soon to know that, I think, personally. Yeah. I mean, maybe JH may know of other states and how Well, I could give you uh, some examples. We haven't discussed uh, think tanks and government affairs institutes. Okay. Some of them have a problem because they get state funding, um, but some of them have shriven to um, have thoughtful debates on this issue, and that can help a lot. And I don't know to what extent there are local institutes that are independent law schools, public affairs. Yes. And sometimes they have their own sort of agendas in Rhode Island, the local public affairs since it was very involved and they tried to get the, um, the school leaders because they are the major um, educators of school board members. They come to the institute to pursue so, their issues, so it, 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 it fit in, in what with other, the agenda. In, in other states that you're covering, I mean, how does it happen? Do the existing mm, grassroots type organizations, uh, they plan to be involved in this conversation, they look for issues, or do the issues find them? Uh, and, the, and they build themselves around a given issue that uh, they hope will be taken up at the, at the Constitutional Convention. Well, in New York, where the last one took place, Citizens Union was arguably the leader. They go back to the great progressive era in New York from the 1890s, and they're very well respected in New York. They have a small staff, like three or four people, and they're, they forget every 20 years, sort of, you know, about the issue. They have to start from scratch. And uh, they went out and they were, during the debates that the newspapers and whatnot held, um, they were often the, the yes folks. They put together um, pretty good literature and whatnot. But you, so, you anticipated, you could anticipate yeah. that this organization and organizations like it would rise up to the occasion, that would go out and find it. Would, yeah, would well, most states don't have a citizens union that has this long tradition and credibility with yeah. the media Maybe and we whatnot. Have one, huh? And there was another fellow, a wealthy individual that also ran a local radio show whose father was one of the great champions of state constitutional inventions in uh, the 1960s and whatnot. And so he had a sort of a family interest and, and he took it on himself. He hired a very talented graphic artist and whatnot. They did a bunch of things that were impressive, but at the end of the day, it was, you know, a hundred to one or more in terms of financial resources and organizations, Which, you know, pro probably a, a thousand here, to, uh, to one. I mean, you can't motivate people like teachers who are worried about losing their pensions. I mean, they made 500,000 phone calls in New York. There's nobody like that. Who's, who would do that on behalf of a convention or something like that? They got 300,000 signs on like on every block in, in New York. Well, it somebody had out, galvanized Well them. organized. So uh, but, but if there's, I'm uh, concerned uh, about an issue, yeah. take it a teacher's issue, take, take any issue really that yeah. can't be handled by the legislature. And I want to have a constitutional convention here in Hawaii. I, I'm, I'm framing this as a how-to question. Yeah. 
how do I establish a coalition? If I wake up one morning, whether I'm part of a, a group like Common Cause or the Citizens Union or not, mm -hmm. and, I, and I say, I want to participate because I want some relief in this Constitutional Convention. How do you, politically, how do you build a coalition? Who do you call? What, what, what do you put out first in order to make this happen? Well, just one thing that the yes folks do tend to tend to do very well. They tend to do well in the op-eds, very well in You're the right, editorials. Yes, unfortunately, nobody reads op-eds anymore, <laughs> and they're not very useful. They used to be much more influential, so that's that's pretty discouraging. Uh, Let's but, put it in terms of Hawaii, Peter. We so you would treat it if I was activated by a particular issue. Let's say I mean just decentralizing out of a single school district, or whatever it is, you know, or term limits. Uh, if, I, if I was on that side of the, uh, you know, argument, which I'm not, I'm ambivalent myself. So, but I would treat it like you would any other campaign, any other campaign. You would start with neighborhoods, you would start to, you, know, you remember like the Live Aloha campaign with bumper stickers and 10, here's 10 things you could, I mean, it's a mobilization effort. A mobilization, and, yeah. But you gotta remember that everybody on the uh, no side is also mobilizing and they will have a lot of resources, but you would treat it the same way. You would treat it the same way as you would in, a, in you know, kind of a community issue, but scaled up. Well, let me ask you a, a, my closing question. I'll ask you both. But, um, so here we are, um, and it's uh, wait, October maybe, September, October, uh, and there has been that, that PR campaign you talked about. There's been an education campaign, hopefully we can all participate in mm -hmm. raising public awareness. Um, now the public has a certain understanding. It's heard from the naysayers. Uh, it's heard, or it's, it's hearing from, um, you know, the, the, the grassroots, if you will, the, the ones who would like, you know, the, the, the con con to provide a certain relief to them. Um, what do you predict will happen? Well, and that could be very confusing at the end if there's lots and lots of issues. People say a pox on all of this is too complicated. I don't want to participate in this. Well, there, there's one, just one other kind of com what, uh, complexifying factor. On the ballot in November, there will be two issues about the Constitution, not one. So the one, whether there should be a constitutional convention, is a decadal question. It'll come up. It's, it's forced to come up. But the other constitutional question is the one the legislature just put on there, which has to do with the use of property taxes for uh, That is teachers. complexifying. So all of a sudden, you got these two things, and you might wind up voting for one, not the other, yeah. or you're going to vote yeah. for both. Yeah. So it's there's going to be a lot of confusion just by the appearance of the ballot. So we should all, you know, uh, try to have people understand what that's all about. There's a whole bunch of confusing things about the ballot. Yeah. The most fundamental, I did an op-ed just on this in the Star Advertiser, it doesn't clearly mention it's a state constitutional convention that you're voting on there. <laughs> it says most people don't know they even have a state constitution. They think they're going to be, the idea is to, you know, revise the federal constitution, which people think of as sort of a Bible and whatnot. There's just so much confusion. Well, taking all of that into account, Okay, and trying to look down the road, and I know the road is kind of foggy right now. I like where this is going. But I, 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 <laughs> I like you're going to love my last question here. So, <laughs> can you guys make a prediction for me about what's going to happen here? And, and I'm asking for a simple answer: Will people vote for it or not? Will we have one or not? Wow. <laughs> I, I think the opposition is, right now it's ahead. The, the, the civic beat poll suggests it's, it's way ahead. And the problem is uh, the opposition will spend whatever it takes to defeat it at the end. Spend so a lot, too. Oh, oh, yeah. So you have to be very pessimistic. And by the way, the campaign finance laws in Hawaii, just, that's, it's mostly, even though it's normally there, you're not going to see it. So uh, what, do you, what do you mean the, in Hawaii? How about the whole country? That's right. Yes, yes. But I think in the last one you had like a half dozen items on the referendum, there was zero money reported spent on it. Uh, so it's just a chronic problem here. So you're pessimistic. I, I think you have to be pessimistic. <laughs> now, if you have a, a missile alert type of situation, I mean, America could change. 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 Oh, it's it's all driven by crisis. The only time you get democratic reforms <laughs> is and one of the tragedies on this issue. It's a classic, you know, below the public radar collective action but, problem. But it's exciting. And, and, and unless you have something it urgent, it's very it's difficult. It's exciting. To have it's a, a great example of our of our democratic process. Yeah. And you guys are both committed, and so am I, and into having the process work as well as it can, having people understand it. What's your prediction, Peter? So, um, I'm sorry to beg the question, but
but someone asked Chow Enlai, Lai, the former premier of China, when he was uh, fairly senior and getting ready to step down, they said, what do you think of the French Revolution? And he said, it's too soon to tell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's where I, that's I think it's too soon to tell. <laughs> Peter Adler, <coughs> Core Three Point Zero Network, and J. H. Snyder from the uh, let me get this right, the editor State. of the Hawaii <laughs> State Constitutional Convention Clearinghouse. Thank you so much for showing up. Uh, I, I I I bless you both for being involved <laughs> in this conversation, and I hope it gets very robust as we go forward. Thank